the chat that this is working would be really great. Thank you. <laughs> I know last week I struggled a little bit getting it going. Am I live? Am I working? Oh, hello there. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, we know Twitch is working, so I hope YouTube is too, because I know YouTube is where I was having issues last week. Oh, hi, Shai. Oh, brilliant. Okay, I'm working. That's amazing. Okay, so today I'm going to be teaching you um, the Scandinavian, which when I heard I was going to be teaching the Scandinavian, I was a bit nervous to start with because I don't play the Scandinavian and I don't know much about it. So with a bit of googling and help from a friend I've sort of pieced together a lesson on the Scandinavian and I hope by the end of this you'll actually feel comfortable playing this. Um, oh hi there. So um, I hope you'll feel comfortable playing this you know regularly in tournaments and this whole repertoire will suit you. So I'll flip the board here. So when coming up with a line, I didn't want to come up with anything too tricky or too difficult, just a really simple setup you can play against nearly anything and you'll never get into trouble in the opening. Now I can't promise you you'll ever get a winning position from the opening from this because it's not one of those lines, but I do hope that you'll never be losing out of the opening. It won't take a lot of memorization or a lot of time, but it's a solid setup and a solid system that should hopefully, hopefully get you through. Um, do I speak Spanish? No, I, I don't speak Spanish, I'm afraid. There are other Spanish streams on from Code Chess and Chess 24, but this isn't one of them. So we're going to get right to it and we'll start. So it's against e4 and the Scandinavian is d5. And another one reason why the Scandinavian is so great is you take your opponent out of their comfort zone really quickly. Because most e4 players are either hoping for e5 or the Sicilian, and they can get in either Italian, you know, they can get in Rolly Pez, King's Gambit, whatever they want to play. But when you play d5, you're sort of controlling the game straight away and you're dictating what line it goes into. We're gonna look at lots of lines, but we're gonna look at E takes d5 first, because that's the main line. It's the most logical thing to do. We will at some stage look at knight c3 as well, but we'll look at this first. So now, actually my first thought when preparing this was to show you guys knight f6, because it's something I've played myself. Um, but it's not a, it's not very sound, so, I thought queen takes d5 is a much more sound, sensible way to go about this. And most of the time they'll play knight, F, knight c3, which is what we'll look at first. And you have a couple of options here. But what we're going to look at is we're going to look at queen a5. It's the main line and what I recommend. So now there's a couple of moves for white, but if they want to play for an advantage and to play well, they're going to have to get the moves d4 in and knight f3. They can play them in different orders, but these are the two moves they're going to be playing. Because playing something like after knight f6, bishop b5, someone's looked at my prep. Yes, this is oh, knight, after knight after knight f6, bishop b5. Here. I'm quite confused. We're going after knight f3, bishop g4 is what we'll be looking at. Um, after e4, d5, black can also go in the black marked gambit. Mm -hmm. They can, yeah, and we can look at some stuff like that later. b4 is an interesting possibility, it is. More stuff we're going to be going over. Yeah, so there is the d6 line, which is good, but queen d a5, I think, is easier. And we'll look at the move d4 first, because it's a move they should be playing if they're playing for an advantage. They need to develop this dark square bishop, and putting the pawn on d3 doesn't make any sense because you're blocking in your own bishop, and this gains space in the center. So it's what they normally play. 
you develop a piece and they develop a piece. Someone who was saying ideas like after knight f6, bishop b5, I think you should just like c6 is a useful move for black in these positions. And I don't know what the bishop now has to do. It has to come back maybe to c4 and you've gained a tempo. So they're going to play knight f3 most likely. And after they play moves like this, the move I want to look at with you guys and teach you today is bishop g4. Oh, before the queen comes out. Okay, well, I don't want to go back now, but I will definitely, after I show you this, we're going to have a look at that. So. Oh, yes, knight f6, bishop b5. Yes, no, you're right. That is one of the reasons why you shouldn't play knight f6. You should take with the queen because bishop b5 and after bishop d7, bishop e2 is really annoying. Okay, so after bishop g5, the idea is you're pinning this knight. And if they don't do anything about it and they just continue development, well, you've got your bishop on a really good square. But the only reason why bishop g4 isn't played that much is they can play h3. So if they don't play h3, you've developed your bishop to a really good square and your life is good. But h3 is a bit of a problem. So what happens if you go bishop h5? Well, someone just said there is this not similar to the Vichy Nan game where he plays h3, g4. Yeah, so this is what I'm going to show you now. If you go bishop h5, they're going to go g4, bishop g6, knight e5, and they'll follow it up by pushing this h pawn. And that's not a position that anyone wants to be in. This is not comfortable for black, and I'm not going to be like, I'm not going to be here trying to teach you this. So that's why after h3 we can't play our bishop back. And if you just bring your bishop back here, well you've definitely wasted a move. So the move I'm going to recommend is to take the knight, which looks quite strange. But I'll explain it to you. Because after queen takes, you just play c6 and black is a really easy nice position. So some of the downsides and why this might not be played at super top level is you've given up the bishop pair. And you can also claim you've wasted time developing your bishop, but they've also wasted time too. So it's not a big deal. But when you're playing not at super high level, it's very difficult for them to take advantage of the fact they have the bishop pair. It might be slightly better for them, but you can, eat, you can trade off a pair of bishops or and you can hit in the center eventually, and your position's really easy to play. So I wouldn't be too worried about giving up a bishop pair. Whatever they play next, you sort of play the same moves. Okay, so by taking their knight means you're helping them develop the white queen. Well, is the queen doing a huge amount there? C6 is a move you want to play anyway in these positions. It's a really good move. And the queen on f3 isn't brilliant. You might be losing time, but your position, like I said, this, this is not like the refutation to e4, this line I'm showing you. It's a really solid setup where you're not gonna get into any trouble and you're gonna have a nice and easy, a nice easy plan. So after c6 and bishop d2, you develop your next piece. They castle and you play e6. So if we look at this position here, this is the kind of typical position from these lines. You get your pawn on e6, your pawn on c6, your knights develop like this, and you're going to bring the queen back to c7, either your bishop on d6 or e7, and you can castle either way. If you castle kingside, we're going to look at a game with that. It leads to more aggressive games. Castle queenside, your position is really solid and fine. And here, you just aim to hit in the center with a move like c5, maybe e5, maybe try to swap off the dark squared bishops. 
Yeah, so as someone says, it looks really solid for black. It's very difficult to go wrong. It's not an opening where if you make a mistake and you forget a move, you're going to be lost. If you play these moves, no matter what, your position will be fine, you'll get a playable game. And if you're looking for an opening that you just want to get out of the opening without any trouble, any stress, something I'm often looking for because I don't like learning huge amounts of theory, this will suit you really well. So we're going to look at a couple of games in this line now to kind of illustrate this. So this is the first game I'm going to show you. Is bishop b4 ever a threat? For, for um, we'll look at bishop b4 for black. The problem with bishop b4 is they just go a3 and some people do play this and then they trade their bishop for the um, knight on c3, but it's not really, um, I don't think it's the best way to play, but it is a possible idea. So we'll see, this time they play knight f3 first instead of d4, but as we can see it all kind of transposes if you know where your pieces want to end up. Play bishop g4 as usual, they play h3, now you take, because we always want to take because we don't want to bring our bishop back, they take back. The queen is threatening b7, so you play c6 to block it. It's a move you want to play in your system anyway. Now they play d4. You develop your piece. And as you can see, there's been a different move order, but you've got to your same solid setup, and it's all fine. So after king b1, the queen comes back to c7, and after g5, a6. a6 is just to stop any, sorry, after g4, a6. It's just to stop any g5 ideas at any point. After h4, castles, and g5. So they can play g5, but they can't take back with, a, well, they can take back with a pawn, but I'm not sure. I'm not convinced this is the strongest the knight. Well, you'd have to trade rooks first, obviously. But the knight looks strong on d5. And this position is fine for black. So after it takes, and bishop takes, let's see if we can find the idea here for black. And this is, why I want to show you this game is it's a really common idea in these lines which is really useful to understand. So as I mentioned earlier, white has the bishop pair. So can chat, let's see if anyone makes this a little bit more interactive, can come up with a plan here to try to trade a pair of bishops. So if anyone has any ideas at all, just type them in and we can look at them. How would you play a position like this? Okay, yeah, so bishop e7, really good move. And what was played in the game? And after they develop their piece, the follow-up idea of something like bishop e7 is knight d5, yeah. So that seems to be the obvious idea, and that's right. It's not a very complicated position to play, you just want the bishop pair off. But you can't play knight d5 straight away, can you? Does this work? What's the problem with knight d5? Um, F7 isn't the problem here. There's a bigger problem. <laughs> yeah, just knight takes d5. It threatens the queen, so you have to recapture. And then they just take your piece. So black set this up 
would knight b6 first? Yeah, the bishop won't be guarded. So you just play knight b6, a really simple, logical move if you think about it. You want to get the knight to d5, you can't do it straight away, so set it off. So after they continue h5, you just play the plan. They trade, and you trade. So sort of like goal number one in your setup has been achieved here. They no longer have the bishop pair. Your life is easy. So now what are you going to do? You've gotten rid of their bishop pair. What's the next plan? Let's see if chat has any ideas about how you might continue this game off. So what's white's an other advantage in this position? Yeah, attack with queen b4. Someone is aggressive there, I am. It's interesting. But if they just, like, they can also trade on d5, but they can do lots of things. I'm not sure where your attack is going with queen b4. It's aggressive, but followed by knight c4, but they could just do a lot of things there. I mean, if you go queen b4, well, it's not your go, they can even just kick you. Some people saying double the rooks on the h file. Again, it's not a bad idea. Trading on c3, there's lots of good ideas. Queen g5. Um, well, if you play queen g5, well, I know, okay, it's not we'll putting a move for black here. Well, yeah, black played here. I don't think that was to prevent queen g5, because after queen g5, there's always, like, say they played here and the knight can't take it for some reason. There's always just, like, rook here, and I'm not sure what the queen's really doing. Um, Yeah, and now this, this idea is not so strong, because the queen can come over. Trading on c3... Nothing wrong with it, but yeah, someone said you want to attack in the center. So white has more space in the center. They have the strong pawn on d4. We need to either try, like c5 and e5 are kind of the moves that want to be played. So there's a slow way to set this up. After here, black plays very slowly, just improving their pieces. And they're probably going to eventually prepare to play something like c5 or e5. But in this position, to stop an ever, ever a c5 push, white puts their knight on c5. So this is going to be a ta tactics time for everyone. Who can spot the problem with knight c5? So they're putting there so you can never push. There's moves like knight back here to get rid of it, but that's going to drop the pawn right now. Although there is rook f8, I'm still not convinced by that idea. Is white better in this position? Well, not in this position because they made a mistake. I think if you put this opening and system onto the engine, the engine will give white a slight advantage, but it's not an easy advantage to realize, especially at a level, uh, not a high level, e6 fork. Andrew, sorry, I'm a bit confused by your e Like, I push e6? To e5? Oh, are you saying white's threatening the e6 fork? Well, the pawn's defending it, and it's also black's go here. Okay, <laughs> just a typo, no problem. Okay, g5. Ooh. Not something I looked at. They'll just move the rook back. Okay, someone's nearly got it here. Someone's saying e5 and after takes. Yep, 
Yeah, knight c3 wins an exchange. Does it? What's wrong with knight c3? Why wasn't um Oh no, what am I thinking? The queen can just take. Yeah. So no, it's a nice idea, but knight c3 they'll just take there. What else can we do after e takes c5? No, queen e7, well done there, Calvin. Yeah, queen e7. Forking the two pieces. And actually, white was an, an international monster, 2400, and they took here, allowing this fork. What they should do, yeah, after getting an e5, is just to retreat the knight and get a position like this. And the game continues. So this is like a big thing about this opening. You just get a really solid, normal game out of it. And you've gotten rid of white center, and you play on. But they just made a mistake. They took here, and they finished there. So does that game kind of make a bit of sense to everyone, what you did there? You got your typical setup, you removed the bishop pair, then you tried to destroy their center, and by doing so, you actually ended up winning the piece. If that game was all clear, we're going to move on to a bit more of an exciting game in this variation. I think it is here. So we're going to go through it again. We're just going to go through this opening slowly. So e4, you play d5, and after they take, you take back with queen. The knight's going to attack your queen. So as everyone's saying in chat, there's loads of ways to play this. But we're looking at queen a5 today. And after d4, you develop your knight, they develop their knight, and you pin it, the key move, which is different from the main line and what might throw your opponents off. So to, to get rid of this bishop, because if you can just keep your bishop there, you're really happy, they play h3. Now, as we said, we can't move it back. We're going to be going over this lots of times, so we all get it. They just push here and all of a sudden your position is falling apart because they'll push your h pawn, their h pawn down the board and it's just not looking pretty at all. We don't want that. So instead you capture, they take back c6, develop their bishop, now knight d7, the same stuff, they castle and e6, and you've got your setup. This time in this game, they play bishop f4, instead of king b1, which we saw in the last game. But the great thing about this opening is no matter what they do, you can sort of do the same thing. So queen c7 was played again, and they brought their bishop back, and bishop d6. So it's the same sort of idea as being played, but what's a change from this one is you have a lot of flexibility here and this time black decided to castle short. So if you're looking for a more aggressive game and want something sharper, you can go into this opposite side castle. If you don't, you also have the flexibility to castle long here, which is something that's really nice. But okay, castle short was played. Well, maybe you can't castle long just now because they'll play g5. But you can do something similar to the other game where you play h6 to stop this ever being played. But okay, castles were what was done. So we'll look at what actually happened in the game. Yeah, good luck checking that king with a billion pieces of defending. Well, both sides' kings are pretty well defended. So yeah, it's not going to be an easy game to mate for either side, really, because you're both well defended. So after the knight comes back, hit with c5. So we've got the same idea again. Although it's a more aggressive position this time, 
the same thing is really being done. You're hitting in the center, but you're also opening the semi-open file. After g4, can anyone tell me a good continuation for black here? Moving the knight isn't going to be so great. There aren't many good squares for it, and it's an important defensive piece. So black needs to find another resource. Does the chat have any suggestions? No, I'm going to attack here, but if we move that knight away, that knight's going to be really useful. Mm -hmm. So c4, someone said this is like c6, e6, which is really similar to the slab. It is another really, like the slab is a very solid setup and this is similar to it. But yeah, c4 makes it a lot more difficult. Because now if the bishop comes here, knight d5, and this bishop is looking terrible on this side of the board. So they can't move. Instead, they take. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like you can just play stuff like b5 and c4 trapping. Oh, well, you're saying b5 straight away. b5 straight away? doesn't really work. And the problem is they'll take here with tempo. And when you take back, they can now take your knight. But like the idea is nice, but you just need to play c4 straight off. You need to be a little more, you know, a little stronger about it and just keep attacking. So they take, you take here. Now they can't go and do something like this because it's just checkmate. So they have to take back, and now, and now, recapturing is one option. Is there something better you can do instead of recapture? It's a tricky idea, so I'm going to see if anyone can figure it out, and then I'll explain it. So in this position, I'll give you some help when you're trying to figure this out. We have to figure out when you're going to be defending where your pieces are best suited. So when I see this position, like, even though I know I'm going to take back on f6 eventually with my knight. Yes, once it rook ac8, they're nearly there, shy, and I'll go why it's not actually the best, but you're very close. So you're going to be wanting to protect the g7 pawn. Queen b6 or a6? Well, if queen b6 or a6, you're making no direct threats. So it's rook fc8. Oh, yeah, rook fc8 instead. And why is the rook? Why this is so good is because eventually you're going to take back here, and you the g7 pawn is the pawn that's like the weakest. So you're going to want your knight on f8 maybe to defend it, or your bishop, sorry, you're not on e8, or your bishop on f8. And right now, a move like this, a move like knight, and e8 will trap your rook in forever. And also you might want to push your a pawn, meaning you want to keep your rook on the a file, which is why they flick in rook c8 first, threatening the checkmate. They have to defend it, and now you can take. And this is just a slightly preferable version of what happened before, because they've had the move c4 in, which weakens their king, and you have your rook in a better position. And someone said they're starting like this opening who'd have, for black, who'd have thought you get a position like this. It's true, there's actually lots of potential to attack in what can seem like quite a boring position. So they come and attack your g7 pawn. So black just defends it nice and easily not allowing anything like bishop h6 to even be a worry in the future. King gets off the semi-open file, and you start to open the a file. So, c4, c5. I'm kind of curious to what people think of this move, because when I was analysing this game, I couldn't really understand it too much. I know they want to keep the bishop 
maybe off this diagonal. But the bishop's home seems to be f1. It seems to be a really good square for the bishop. It's defending, but also keeping potential to be later brought into the attack. And b6 now is an easy move to play. So I didn't really understand c5. It seemed quite confusing. So if anyone has any ideas why they play it, do let me know because I couldn't really get my head around it. So after knight c3, someone was saying c4 was the plan. I'm not sure what you mean there, but okay. So after knight c3, yeah, it could just be an accuracy, exactly lots of these are, I know these are strong players, both 2500s, but people make mistakes. It's probably something I'm missing, but when you have a pawn like c5, the move like b6 is just begging to be played. Yeah, they were probably trying to open up this square, but it seemed very weakening because b6 now is very easily played, opening up this b file. After here, here, bishop here, pushes, we get to an interesting position. White now plays this pawn sacrifice. And this is like the real crux of the position here. Because they're putting all their pieces down on g7, they're attacking the queen. So in some ways you could say it's a really strong pawn sacrifice. Because after takes, the knight's coming into d6. These pieces are kind of tied down to bending this g7 pawn. Taking is an option. But, um, but white's pieces are coming into play very quickly. So I want pose everyone like a question here after this and this because this is what happened if you just take here white's got a really strong active attack so black to play what else can you do if you use your principles of defense so stuff you want to do when you're defending well i mean counter attack is one you can also swap some pieces off and there's lots of things you can do. Also important to remember the black is a pawn up here. What's that? Rook d8. Okay, so I'll show you rook d8. I'm tempted just to take here. And if you take back, I'm not so, oh, not there. I'm not so confident. Or no, like queen f6. Keep everything very clear cut. Looks quite crushing. Yeah, so d4. So someone said b4. So the problem with the b4 is you're literally just asking them to take here, which is your problem. So I know the idea is to clear the c file, but not when this is happening. So yeah, shame there said d4. You are forcing a queen trade. And now they recapture. Okay, I think I'm gonna leave this game here because we've kind of got through the key middle game that arises out of this um, opening. Black went on to win this ending because they managed to win this pawn and then they were a whole pawn up and the game was fairly straightforward. But what I wanted to kind of show with those two games in the main line, that sometimes it can be super aggressive and fun and sometimes it can just be a much e an easy, simple game where you swap off the bishop pair, you get into the center, and then you just get into a game. And whatever happens, happens. It's down to probably who's the stronger player. Okay. So, but now I want to show you what if they don't play the main line, because obviously not everyone is going to play into that. And the great thing about this opening is even if they play something different, you can still play your setup. 
So here they play knight f3. And the idea of knight f3 is they're not committing to the knight to c3, so that eventually they can play c4. So let's guess, you know, you just develop your knight as well. All these moves are moves you want to play. c6, bishop there, and bishop here. And we can probably see that these were all the moves we played in the other opening. In the other game, except the knight is not on c3 and the queen's not on a5. There's small differences, but it's all pretty much the same. Castle. e6. So yeah, there is a slight thing here. It's not that important, and if you get it wrong, like I said, there's no way you're going to be losing. But the knight isn't played to d7 here, just because after h3, takes and takes. In these positions, you don't want the queen coming to a5, you want the queen coming to d8, just because the queen's not really doing anything on a5 anymore. It was better there earlier, but now, now, like, what, it, it's got no purpose, they can just hit it with bishop coming to here. So that's why e6 is played first. So after push, we can drop the queen back. Now, let's see, the next few moves are all quite typical of our setup. We castled, got the pawn on c6, got the pawn on e6, got the, knight, the bishop on e7, all solid, all fine. After bishop here, knight here, queen here, developing all the pieces, it's time to hit in the centre. So you've done the thing as usual, you've got your structure, you've castled, your king is safe, you now need to kind of take down the centre. So the obvious move, or maybe a move that springs to mind to me anyway, is c5. Anyone in chat have any ideas about c5? Is it a good move? Or is there better? And if it is a good move, why? And if it's not, any ideas why too? because you think you're hitting in center. Okay, knight b5? Yeah, knight b5 is definitely an option in this b-pawn. You could be in some trouble, but I think it's just, um, yeah, like this is definitely nice for, nice for white, but it's even simpler that you can take, and when they take back, like b4 is just really good. Your knight is forced back again, and now there's knight b5. I think white has just got a really strong position with lots more space here. So yeah, knight b5 is always an issue you have to be on the lookout for. Okay, yeah, if the pawn is not captured, this bishop could be inactive maybe, but there's no way for them to close the position. So I would agree with you if they could close the position and get this pawn stuck behind it. But right now, that's not really going to happen. I wouldn't be too worried about the dark squared bishop. Instead, though, of c5, a6 is played to stop the knight ever jumping to b5, because that can provide like a lot of stress. So after rook here, rook here, and b4, you hit in the center. After they push, now again, you've sort of got quite an equal game. Just because of time, I'm not sure I'm gonna go through the whole thing. We'll go through a bit more because I feel like some this is still important enough for understanding this opening. But you kind of, you set up your pieces, you've hit in the center. So now, when you're coming up with plans, I'll go back to chat to see if anyone has any idea how they would navigate this position. What would you do when creating a middle game plan here? This bishop isn't looking great on e7. How can we activate our pieces? e5. I hadn't looked at that. I like it, but I'm also a bit... 
a bit skeptical. Yeah, and why why might be a little bit skeptical of e5? If they take happy days. But here I'd be worried about d5. This seems really good. You kind of have to take and now they recapture and you've made a pass pawn for white. And if it can be avoided, you shouldn't be giving your opponents pass pawns for free. So yeah, lots of people are saying knight d5. Maybe black is a little cramped here. That's true, but you can easily, you can maybe target this pawn on d4 at some point and open the a file. So these are the plans. You get the strong square, you put a rook maybe on the a file at some point. Some of you will try to open it up. And so someone said, Oh, but then a5, so you're, okay. So here, here, here. You're telling me now a5 or after takes? You have to take first. Yeah, so I'm going back to the previous variation for you, but you can't, uh, like, you can't play this now because that's a big problem. So it takes, takes, takes takes a5 and they can just take I think this looks good for white like they're a pawn up and your b pawn is no weaker than their pawns um, so I wouldn't be confident. I wouldn't be confident going into this and allowing that for them. You're giving them a lot of chances. So it's better just to take this d5 square. And okay, I actually have quite a bit more to show you on this. So I'm not going to, sorry, I will go through that. I can't go through that variation in detail now just for time. And I might just leave the game here. Um, it ended in a win for black, but what's really important is there is actually, you may look cramped, but your position is really fine. You move the rook to the a file, try to push this a pawn. You can put a bishop on f3, reroute your knight to somewhere like f5 and target this pawn. The position is nice. Again, you're not running into any trouble and it is not easy for white to come up with a plan. So, okay, now we're gonna look at other stuff because um, we're going to look at a slightly different variation again. Yeah, so perfect. We've done all the, we've done all the e4, d5 takes main lines. We're now going to look at this. So this is just a different move order, but gets into the same position. So this is basically if they play e4, d5, knight here. It's the same thing. So what happens if they don't take but defend? But the game went knight here, d5, e4. So again, there are loads of pressing ways to play this with d4, but it's good, but you're gonna to have to spend a bit of time learning stuff. And I need an hour to teach you this, and I just wanted to teach everyone something that they can play easily without any stress or any worries and get into a good position. So I recommend taking. And now when they take back, what do you do? You want to develop your pieces. Now, if you play tonight to F6 straight away, you're kind of messing up your pawn structure one way or the other. Well, I'm saying you can transpose into a French, so after e4, d5. Oh, okay, yeah, so that's interesting. We'll go through this quickly. e4, d5. If they play d4, yes, this is the black dime or gambit, which I haven't, I think this is, which I haven't actually covered today. And if you are going to play this, I would recommend you look it up, but it's nothing to be worried about, so just check it out. 
I didn't have enough time in this class to look over this line. It's not a main line. It's nothing I would be ever stressed about. But yeah, if you're a French player, just do this and confuse everyone who have gone through a Scandinavian to a black point gambit to a French. Get as many openings in there as possible. But okay, we'll look at the game. So what I'm saying is you don't want to play knight f6 because you're just like, you're getting yourself weak pawns for no reason. So knight d7 is the move here. And after bishop here, your overall goal is to play knight f6 and develop like this. But this is not perfect because of takes here. And after takes back, check. And we're going to leave this to chat to figure this out. What is going on? Should the king go to e8 or g8? And what happens after them? <laughs> go to bishop. Um, I'm saying you can also get to the Karakan. Yeah, I mean, you can get to so many openings here. Invisible confusion. This position is confusing. But who is winning? Well, the answer is it's actually equal. But I like this for white. So e8 or g8? Which one are you all playing? You have to choose one. Let's see what's everyone saying. Where is your king running to? Someone says g8 and I would agree. There's a bit of a problem with king e8 and that is that your queen is gone. So you don't want to be losing your queen like that, so g8 is more sensible. Someone's saying e8 to not trap the rook. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to trap your rook either. Yeah, okay, well, oh, king g6, and even look at that. Um, wow, no, don't do this. I'm not even sure why, but I would just say here, you do, yeah. King g6, I mean, they're just going to play d4 and give you a check on d6 and not fun. So king g8 must be played to save the queen. And after knight e6, queen here, there is a fork anyway. But it's an interesting position. You could say maybe this knight's being trapped. But we don't want to go into that. We just want a really easy opening to to play to get out the opening stress-free. You don't want to be worried about all these sacrifices. So just play e6 and life is easy. After knight here, the knight comes here. They take, you take, and we'll look over this game a little bit. So a6 is played here. You can go with your normal plan, but play your bishop here, knight here, and yeah, c. Five. So in these positions what you're doing is you don't get the center straight away, you let them get it and you're eventually hitting with c5. Move order really doesn't matter. Someone's saying they blunder the whole game, that's okay, I probably would too. When they take, when, when you see a move like bishop takes f7 and your heart's just pounding, it's not fun. So play something much slower like this. You can castle here. Someone says they want to castle, yes, always good to castle. But c5 was played, and that's the beauty. You can castle, then c5, you c5, play c5, then castle. You've got your pieces developed. It's, you've got no worries, and that's what's just really nice. So this is how the game went. And after a trade of queens, they then, they then played b5. Bishop here, they were taking their time. And eventually castles. Damn, the Scandinavian looks like a great opening. Well, I'm glad someone likes it as an opening. I think it's great. I think it's easy, straightforward, and just very simple to play. Who is she? My name is Alice O'Gorman. You could say it becomes boring. You don't have to trade queens, and that's another thing. You can do a lot of things here. Trading queens is just how this game went. Like, in Queen C7. If this opening is quite fine, why don't top GMs play it? I think I said this at the start. It, it is fine 
for my level and I don't know the average level of the chat but I would guess it's definitely fine for yours too. The problem is at top level, like that first line I showed you, the main line, where top GMs can get that bishop pair. Like if you're playing a top GM and they can get the bishop pair off you in the opening, they can probably grind down half a pawn advantage. But I would be surprised if anyone else can. Yeah, I think it's much... Um, yeah, there's much more to the Scandinavian than meets the eye. And that's the thing, you might not be getting... Um, you might be getting a slightly worse position. If even, but you can easily just sort of like attack back in the center and you know your plan. That is true, Carlson played it sometimes. I think he played the queen d8 version, not the queen a5. He didn't play the lines I'm recommending. And because the lines I'm recommending aren't critical, and at top level they need to be critical. Um, so, but if you play this every game and your opponent only plays it one in a hundred games, if even, you're going to be a lot more comfortable with the ideas as well, which is another really great thing about it. Ali, is Carlson playing in London? Maybe he is. Okay, but I just want to show you a couple more lines so you're completely prepared about everything. Oh, what is this? Okay, yeah, this is just how it got into the position. I was confused when they played c5, but yeah, so it's the same thing. If you play d5, what about f4? This is the tricky one. And you play c5. Here. This is the tricky sharp line you can't avoid, but it's really not that common. This game actually went like this to get to the position. <laughs> oh, hi Vasu. Thank you. Okay, they played on like this and we don't have that much time left, I've realized. So we can't really go through this whole game because it was a really good one. But how this is played is you play for this f5 square. If, and we'll go through a little bit here. Looks like a backwards England gambit, bad version of the Grand Prix. Yeah, it's not, it's not great for white this. You just continue playing, you play e6, and you can see there's quite a few lines in the Karakan, I think, that are similar to this. You control this f5 square. Castles, knight, e7, and you put the knight on f5. Here, develop your pieces, all nice and sensible. h5, okay, so after someone plays h5, the first thing you have to be checking here, like h5 in these positions are good for black and it's how you want to be playing, you want to get the f5 square and try open the h file. But what about g3? Is the bishop trapped? Do you have to make this concession? Because the bishop really doesn't want to be taken here. That's not going to be good in this position. I know I told you earlier um, that you want to be taking on f3, but right now with your attack going, Black's advantage is kind of gone, and I think Black is doing well before. So how else can we meet h3? King d7, I like your ideas and I love to play like this, but yeah, I don't think they can take the piece, to be honest. Um, but there's no need to even play, like King d7, it's really nice, but Knight g3, yeah, Knight g3 is just stronger. Because if they take here, you get two pieces and a killer open file for the... You lose two pieces for rook, but you get a killer open file. And if they move their rook, you can now bring your bishop back to this square and you've got your knight in a really strong square and they've made weaknesses around their king. So that's sort of how to play against the f5 ideas. Yeah, and now king d7, exactly. You. And in that game, the um, black didn't castle at all. They didn't play king d7, they played king um, f8, king g7, because they wanted to keep the rook on the h5. So yeah, you do stuff like that. So it's a fun one to play against, and nothing too scary. You just develop your pieces normally, and just keep an eye on the f5 square, because you can get a knight in there. You're doing really well, because you play h5, open the h file, and h3 is never going to be too good for them because they will open their own h-file 
and they'll give you the G3 square. Finally, there's one more thing I want to go over in the opening before we recap it all, and it's some, what someone said earlier. Oh no, here. What if they play b4? Oh, and someone also asked earlier, is bishop here ever a threat? And no, because if we... Oh, why is king d7 better than castling? Okay, so king d7 is a fun idea in these positions, because if you castle, you're removing the rook from the h-file. And you're, you're going for mate. You want to attack down that h-file. So if you take your rook away from it, your attack is kind of gone. And if it's always, like, I think it's always enjoyable to play moves like king d7 as well, because normally you can't play king d7 because you'll get mated. But if your king is perfectly safe on d7, and it was in that position because there was no way white can attack it, you know, it's a nice move to make and to keep the rook on the h-file. Yeah, so if they play something like bishop b5 here, check. Some people might do that. Like, remember, c6 is part of the setup anyway. You want to play c6, e6, knight f7. Sorry, I'm just going to go back to someone's comment there. So yeah, that's why you don't play bishop b4, because c6 just comes. Someone was saying after, like, c5, f4, d5... E takes d5. Yeah, knight f6 is good. I think you can also... Can you take with the queen? Probably can take with the queen. I don't see any reason why not. And they shouldn't be taking... Like, if they're playing these trappy lines, they'll know what they're doing. And they'll know taking is no good. And again, you just get into a really nice, comfortable position. So, yeah, the final thing I want to show you... is what you do if your opponent plays b4. Because I know if I did something like, you do a mini heart attack when your opponent plays b4. You think it must be some difficult prep and you're not prepared for it. But then just slow down and think like it is a line, but what are they doing? You just take. Rook here and queen here. So now, this is basically the queen d6 Scandinavian, except you're a pawn up and they've got their rook on b1. So is it worth it for them? I would really very much argue no. Um, they could play d4. You just develop normally. Often good to be in shadow in these lines because the bishop's not coming out this way. And a6 too. Yeah, just take and queen d6 as someone said there in the chat. And just play like, play a little, but like the thing is we can't do our normal setup. That's the difference. And why I want to show it to you, because bishop g4 is no good here because you sacrifice the pawn. You sometimes play b4 and bullet because they pre-move and you win the queen. Well, you can do that too. And then if you learn the line for b4 for white, you're going to have that as a backup. So if they do know what they're doing and they take, you're still doing fine. But I don't really think it's a good line. It's just you can't play your usual plan because the pawn hangs. So if you can't develop a bishop normally, just keep in mind that a6 followed by like playing b5 eventually and fianchetto in the bishop is just the way to go. b4 is not scary. You're up a whole pawn for a rook on the b-file, but once you play b5 and fianchetto, your bishop really does nothing. So don't worry about that line. I just wanted to mention it in case it ever came up. So that is my lesson on the Scandinavian in a nutshell. I hope you gave some insight into it. Just to recap there, before I go, I wanted to go over the main line, which you'll get um, a lot. Oh, thank you very much. Well, I hope you liked it. And um, it is just, just to show you all the moves you want in. Go through it one more time. Yeah, you take here, that's the key idea of this whole variation that I hope if everyone gets this, they're doing well. And then c6, e6, castles, and knight d7, and push in the center. <laughs> okay, thank you everyone so much for coming and watching today. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed the lesson, and yeah, I didn't choose it. <laughs> 
but um okay and yeah I might see you next week I might not be here because I have exams but yeah I hope everyone has a really good week and learned a little bit about the Scandinavian okay thank you bye